before, any, we can have any new civilization, any uh, worthwhile culture that is at all comparable to the great cultural periods of the past, we shall have to have a fundamental change in society, in, 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 in our social structure. My name is Michael Paraskas. I work at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. I've been studying Herbert Reed for over 20 years. Well, we're here in the, the Bedford pub in Horsham, which is in the south of England, and we're at a meeting of the Bedford Culture Club, which uh, meets every month to discuss ideas. And we're going to be looking at a film by Hugh Wall on Herbert Reed. My name's Hugh Wall and I made a film about Herbert Reed called To Hell With Culture. Um, Herbert Reed was a modernist writer. He wrote poetry, art criticism, philosophy. Um, he was also in the First World War. He also drew and painted. Um, and he was really central to, to that sort of modernist art movement. And where we're sitting in the Institute of Contemporary Arts uh, it's a place that he founded with Roland Penrose. Good evening. This man is a poet. He writes fiction. He writes art criticism. He's something of a historian. He's an editor. He is a publisher. He is politically committed to a particular variety of anarchism, in the case of Herbert Reed, syndico-anarchism. He is a kind of version of the 20th century Renaissance man. L56203, profile, show. I'd like to begin by asking you a few biographical questions. I believe that you are a Yorkshireman by birth. Yes, I was born in the North Riding of Yorkshire, on a remote farm. The North Riding, as you know, is one of the most unchanged parts of England. Yes. And... Uh, the farm itself was very remote from civilization, as we know it now. Herbert Reed didn't begin as a radical. He grew up in rural North Yorkshire until the age of 10. And his family were really conservative. They were rural conservative farmers. And he talks about this quite openly. It was only after his father's death you know, in 1903 that he actually started to change his political views. In 1915, he was called up to serve in the trenches of the First World War, and this was really a profound moment in his life. It's the moment when socialism and anarchism are not just ideas that he's reading about. It's a lived experience. And his view of the trenches is quite an unusual one. Most people tend to think of the experience of the soldier as being treated like a machine. But he says, no, it, it was a very humanizing experience because you were thrown into this um, terrible situation with other human beings and you create a sort of cooperative or anarchist commune to cope with it. It doesn't have a hierarchy, he tells us. What you have are human beings living together, coping with an inhuman situation. You became in many acts and quiet observances a body and a soul entire. I cannot tell what time your life became mine. Perhaps when one summer night we halted on the roadside in the starlight only, and you sang your sad home songs, dirges which I, standing outside you, coldly condemned. Perhaps one night descending cold, when rum was mighty acceptable, and my doling gave birth to sensual gratitude. And then our fights. We fought together, compact, unanimous. And I felt the pride of leadership. Once the war's over and he leaves the trenches, he becomes a sort of angry young man. So what happens is he starts to channel the experiences and the, 
the, um, the political and the social experiences of the trenches into art criticism. So he becomes one of the leading art critics of his age. Okay. Correspondents Kandinsky, Victor Passmore, Ben Nicholson, Siegfried Sassoon, L.S. Lowry, George Orwell, Henry Miller, John Nash, Paul Nash, Bertrand Russell, Joan Miro, Leo Stein, Dorothy Pound, Ezra Pound, T.E. Lawrence is here. That list is there to kind of, yeah, to, to show that he was really sort of involved with a lot of, um, I suppose what you would call them important figures. But of course there are names in there like Henry Moore and Hapworth, Naum Garbo, all of those people from this kind of modernist movement who were ridiculed at first in the sort of English art world and are now what you might call canons of that modernist movement. And Herbert Reed really helped those unknown artists at the time to sort of gain success, I suppose. Other names like George Orwell, who he was involved with around the Second World War. Orwell was sort of very worried that if it wasn't the, the Nazis who were going to come into the UK and kind of have authoritarian rule, it was, it was going to be the British police. And so he was, there are letters in the Orwell archive where Orwell's writing to Reed and trying to convince him to set up a sort of anarchist printing press in, in Reed's basement. For him, art and anarchism are two sides of the same coin. Anarchists often see creativity as, as central to human experience. Um, and Reed tries to explain that. And what he alights on is the idea of individualism. Anarchism is about the individual being valued in a social context, a political context. But he also looks at art and he says, art is the ultimate expression of human individualism. So the two things are linked in his mind. A song for the Spanish anarchists. The golden lemon is not made, but grows on a green tree. A strong man and his crystal eyes is a man born free. The oxen pass under the yoke, and the blind are led at will. But a man born free is a path of his own, and a house on the hill. Reed was born in the North York Moors, um, and sort of returned there later in his life. He always held this very uh, romantic view of, of nature. And nature comes into his ideas about anarchism and about natural order, um, comes in on a sort of biological level. Um, with forms and shapes that come from nature that people kind of represent in art. The busy routine kills the flowers that blossom only on the casual path. The gift is sacrificed to gain. The gain is ploughed into the hungry ground. The best of life is sparely spent in contemplation of those laws, illustrious in leaves and tiny webs spun by the ground spider in snails, shells, and mushroom gills, in acorns and gourds, the design everywhere evident, the purpose still obscure. Nature for Reed is, is, is magical, I think, and the reason for using all of that in the documentary is that it does link to his ideas, like I was saying, to hell with culture. In some ways, it's a Marxist essay, you know, he's saying people should own the means of production, you know, it should be production for um, use not for profit, you know, people should give according to their ability and you know, receive according to their needs, they're sort of Marxist principles. But he's also bringing in this idea of nature um, and art kind of coming through some kind of biological response to our surroundings. Where Reed goes with his art criticism is, first of all, in rejecting the two dominant forms of art criticism of his time. He rejects the old-fashioned idea of high art and quality based on uh, sort of eternal values. And he rejects Marxism, which seems like the radical alternative to that. What he goes for instead is a, a sort of individualistic response to art based on, um, I suppose, what we might call a, a sort of spiritualist set of values. I've said to hell with culture, and to this consignment we might add another, to hell with the artist. Art as a separate profession is merely a consequence of culture as a separate entity. In a natural society, there will be no precious or privileged beings called artists. There will be only workers. 
Well, there's no doubt, I think, that Reed saw himself as a poet first and foremost. I think he saw poetry as tapping into something fundamental in his nature, something that's, that's inherently him. And that's in the title of his book, and Hugh uses it again in the film, To Hell With Culture. What does he mean by that? Well, culture is everyday life, but art, poetry, taps into something that's beyond everyday life. It's something particularly individual. The situation today is full of promise, and one might say that the world at large is now alert and waiting for whatever new manifestations may appear from a country that, spiritually speaking, is no longer an island. Good night.